Last week, um, Pastor Russ shared with you a, a, a great message. And if you, if you weren't here and, and you haven't seen it yet, by all means, go online and, and, and have a look at that because Russ shared a, a, a lovely focus on the Holy Spirit and, and the Trinity as, as, uh, as the, the part of the, the company of the Holy Spirit. And it was a, a powerful message. An incredible overview of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church and our own individual lives. He doesn't just top you up. Russ said, to being a better you. No, he wants to transform us to being like Jesus through the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And I would just add that he, he wants to build us into community in the process of that, for the fruit can only be evidenced in community. Another big picture facet that's a thanks to Ty Gibson for, for this thought in his little book, uh, The Sonship of Christ, is how the Holy Spirit was there at creation. And I think Russ might have mentioned that, that as well last week. Where the Holy Spirit, it says in Genesis 1, was hovering over the waters. And in that big picture perspective, John's Gospel Um, mentions that Jesus, in talking to Nicodemus, shares of the new creation that's to come about, of being baptised by water and receiving the Holy Spirit. And right at the, um, after Jesus' resurrection, this really becomes quite pronounced, where he appears to his disciples on that first Sunday night, so he's risen from the grave, he's, he's, he's been with his father, and, and here he is with his disciples now, and he's completed his work of recreation on that Friday, and he's rested on the Sabbath, uh, having, um, um, resting from having completed his works, and there on Sunday he appears to his disciples, and he says these words, peace be with you, peace be with you. And at creation, God breathed into man and he came into life. And and, and in John chapter 20 and verse 22, and I hadn't really noticed this before, but as I saw this, it really wowed me into recognising the new creation that Jesus has for us. Where he says, in verse 22, he says, then he breathed on them And he said, receive the Spirit. Breathed on them. And he said, receive the Spirit. There is new life. The power of the Holy Spirit at work in life. It's how we are able to bear witness to his name because it's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. And I want to share with you We've been looking at the, the acts of the Holy Spirit um, over the last weeks. And Roger is sharing in Front Church today, and he'll share with us next week another aspect of the incredible benefits of the Holy Spirit in life with the gospel coming to life and the, and the kingdom of God in the here and now. Um, I'll let him share that with you. Um, in in uh, two weeks' time... We'll have Pastor Joe sharing with you of listening to the Holy Spirit. How can we listen to the Holy Spirit? How do we know it's the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking into our lives? So no pressure, Joe, but I know that you'll have that uh, covered for us. And, um, and today I just want to focus on two stories of contrast from that little book of Acts. And a third story of the Holy Spirit's continuing Um, impact in life today. And the first story is a really unusual one, and uh, it's one that we we tend to be reticent to even sort of focus on, because it's in Acts chapter 5, and it's a story about Ananias and Sapphira. It's one that we wish wasn't there in the book of Acts, um, if we were to uh, to be honest. But I'm sure there's something for us um, today 
as we look at, at this little story and another one that will be, you'll see is related to it. Ananias and Sapphira, two names, the Lord is, the Lord is gracious and beautiful are the meanings of those names. And I see a glimmer of hope just in the names there. The Lord is gracious and beautiful. I'm going to read you the story just to refresh your mind as to what takes place here. There was a certain man named Ananias, verse 1, who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. I wonder who ruled the roost there. Um, No, no, it was obviously a cooperative thing because, uh, as you'll see, um, come up in the story. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? Take note of that. What are we filling our hearts with? You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. And and after selling it, the money was also yours to give away or not. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. And as soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. And everyone who heard about it was terrified. And then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. One down, one to go. As, as soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor. Oh, sorry, about three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter asked her a very leading question. He says, was this price that you and your husband received, was this the price that you and your husband received for your land? Yes, she replied. That was the price. Uh, And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door and they'll carry you out too. And instantly she fell to the floor and died. When the young man came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. You can see why I'm saying we, sometimes we wish this wasn't here in Scripture. It looks like an incredibly strong reaction to a seemingly um, less than, than, um, than, than um, big situation. It's a really tough story for us to un- un- understand, but I'm convinced that good things can come out of bad situations. Gregory Boyd, in his book uh, Cross Vision, provides an excellent approach in dealing with the violence of the Old Testament in particular. We're going to focus a little bit on that early next year in sharing some of the, the stories, the gospel stories of the Old Testament. And he says these words, if we believe that Jesus fully reveals what God is really like, we have no choice but to suspect that something else must be going on when God appears to act violently in the Old Testament and in this situation here as well. And he says, until we have the opportunity to sit down with God face to face, our job is to try and imagine what this something else might be. Words of wisdom in dealing with situations that we're really struggling to comprehend. And what he's saying is that Jesus is the ultimate picture of what God is like. And if we're seeing something that's discrepant to that picture of of what is painted for us in the life uh, of, of, of Jesus, then there's something more that's going on that we're not really fully comprehending. So what can we learn from this sad demise 
of Ananias and Sapphira. First of all, I'd, I'd, I'd say that it's not about generosity, although that was an aside to the story. And just before this story is, is mentioned by Acts, by the writer of Acts, sorry, Luke, um, there's, there's talk of, of how generous the, the church family is towards each other and how they would even sell their properties and, and put it all in, in, the, in the pool and, uh, and then everyone would live out of that pool of resourcing. And it mentions the name of Joseph um, or Barnabas, who we know as being the affirmer, the encourager, of the rest of the, um, of the, of the letter to Acts. And, and these people were so sold on, on, on Jesus' return, that Jesus was coming back very soon, that their material possessions meant nothing to them. And so they, 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 they sold them and, and, and had all of these resources together. They were fully sold on the kingdom of God. So what was it about Ananias and Sapphira then that it was so discrepant to this generosity of spirit that was there in that early church community? I would say that they were, they were operating with a charade. It was a charade to look good in the public eye. They were wanting the prestige and the... And the um, and the well wishes of the rest of their community and, and, the, and the appreciation of the rest of their community without actually, um, without actually um, being and doing what they said they would. They actually lied to the Holy Spirit. And this is mentioned twice there in those first verses of chapter 5. But is that such a bad, is that such a, a, an evil that it warrants this um, um, immediacy of death? What's wrong? What's wrong with a bit of fabrication and self-promotion of generosity? And I guess what we can learn, well, there's a distinct truth that comes through from this is that the Holy Spirit is not a toy to be played with, to be lied to. The Holy Spirit equally cannot be bought and used as a means of power and control. And we see that come up in a story just um, a few pages over in Acts chapter 8 where Philip actually ministers in Samaria and there's a, a man there by the name of Simon, Simon the sorcerer. And it says there in chapter 8 that uh, Simon the sorcerer, in verse 9, he, he'd been there for many years and he was amazing in, um, in what he'd uh, done. And, um, and it says there that he, uh, he was, verse 9, everyone from the least, oh, he, he claimed to be someone great. Sounds like someone else that we might know. Um, and, and everyone from the least to the greatest often spoke of him as the great one, the power of God, and they listened closely to him because for a long time he had astounded them with his magic. Well, when Simon saw what Peter and John did when they came to Samaria and, and, and had given the Holy Spirit to, to everyone that, that was in the, in the group, and the power of the Holy Spirit at work in these people's lives. Simon wanted that ability himself. And so he offered to Peter money to buy this, this ability. But the Holy Spirit's not about money. It can't be bought. It can't be bought and sold. And Peter said some pretty strong things to Simon, and Simon, um, Simon was incredibly repentant over... The, uh, what he'd done and asked, sought forgiveness for having been so inappropriate in thinking that the Holy Spirit was something that could be bought and sold. So it's not about the money. 
It's not about the generosity. It is about taking the Holy Spirit seriously. And this new creation of church that has just taken place, this, this new creation that Jesus himself had died to, to recreate, couldn't afford to have the wrong DNA in its embryonic stage of development. And so the outcomes to this story is that the death of, of two that lead to the salvation of many in not taking the Holy Spirit lightly, glibly, nonchalantly. Not trivialising or taking him for granted and not just based on whimsical emotionalism. Verse 5 and 11 of chapter 5 says that the people were, were terrified, fear, great fear. But it says there were many ongoing conversions. No, it's not a game. It's not a game we're in. This is life. This is life and death. And we're dealing with much bigger things than flesh and blood. I said earlier when I mentioned the meanings of their names that there, there could be a glimmer of hope there. The Lord is gracious and beautiful. And knowing that Jesus is the judge and knowing that he is gracious, that he is a beautiful God, perhaps it's, it, not all is lost in the story, perhaps the end of the story hasn't been told yet for Ananias and Sapphira. But regardless, we have, um, when we get to heaven, we'll be able to sort out the other details of the story that we, we, we may not have completely understood for now. And even in my explanation now is... Um, is leaving you with, still with questions in your mind. Let's trust that God is a God who understands, who is loving. I said there were two stories, and I want to take you to another one in Acts chapter 10. And you'll see the, you'll see the similarities and contrasts as I share this story with you. Since Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, Verse 1 says, who was a captain of the Italian regiment, he was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and he prayed regularly to God. Ha! He gave generously to the poor and he paid, prayed regularly to God. There is a partnership that warrants our notice. Generosity of spirit and devotion of heart to God. I'll keep going. One afternoon about three o'clock he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir, he asked the angel. And the angel replied, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He's staying with Simon a Tanner who lives near the seashore. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants, and he told them what had happened and sent them off to Joppa. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, the next day as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon and he was hungry. What's that remind you of? Who else would, go, would, would, would uh, pray at noon? Yeah. And he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a, a trance. Um, he saw the sky open and something like a large sheep was let down by its four corners. And in the sheep were all sorts of animals, reptiles and birds. And a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, 
Peter declared, I've never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again. And it says that three times this same vision was repeated. And then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. You notice any other time where that number occurred in Peter's life? Do you think Peter would notice when something occurred three times and he'd have recollections of other things in his life? I'm sure that was the case. The denial of his Lord and then the three times where Jesus said, do you love me? Do you love me, Peter? Keep that in mind. So Peter was very perplexed. What could the vision mean? And just meant, then the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house and standing outside the gate, they asked if a man named Simon was staying there. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, notice that, three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs and go there with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. Now, you know, if you, if you had a, a word from the Lord, like a word from the Holy Spirit like that, what would you do? I think you'd want to comply, wouldn't you? And, and I, have, I had sort of a, a picture in my mind that Peter got up straight away and poof, off they went, you know, got on the chariot and away they, they went. But no... Overnight, they stayed overnight, and, and then Peter went off with, and he had six of his entourage with him that went with him. Uh, th- three times, two times three, two of three. And, and, uh, and it was a blessing that he took uh, this number of, of other Jewish um, fellow brothers um, with him, as, uh, as you see play out in the story. And so he gets down to... Um, it gets down to Caesarea and he finds he sees Cornelius and we get down right down to verse 30 of, of chapter 10. I'll read, um, read that verse for you. Cornelius replied, four days ago I was praying in my house about this same time. Three o'clock in the afternoon. What happened at three o'clock in the afternoon? It was, the, it was the afternoon sacrifice. It was the exact time that Jesus was crucified. Incredible that there's the impact of the spirit on Cornelius' life right at that time of the afternoon. And he told me, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your gifts to the poor have been noticed by God. Now send messages to Joppa, da-da-da. And so I sent for you at once and it was good for you to come. Now we're all here Waiting before God. Waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. Waiting before God to hear the message God has given you. You know, I'm just imagining what a thrill it must have been for Peter to to have arrived there. And here's here's this audience of people at this house who are all ears. (laughs) <laughs> ready and raring to hear what he has to say. And it would be an evangelist dream, you know, to have this sort of scenario unfold. And, and for Peter, um, it was just the in- opportunity of his lifetime to be able to share then the gospel um, with, with this group of people. And, um, and we see the outcome of it. In verse 44, even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. And Peter asked, can anyone object to their their being baptised now that they've received the Holy Spirit just as we did? And so he gave the orders for them to be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. 
And afterwards, Cornelius asked him to stay with them for several days. Just an amazing story of how the, the Holy Spirit opened the, opened the doors, opened the pathway for Peter to, to just walk along and walk into that, um, that house and have, have, have people who were already, already tuned in to the, to, to, um, to the gospel and to the Holy Spirit, um, the Holy Spirit's working. Um, at the, the, the outcome of that um, was, was, was pretty amazing, but when Peter arrived back in Jerusalem, the, uh, the apostles that were there, it, it says in verse 2 of chapter 11, but when Peter arrived back in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers criticised him. You entered the home of Gentiles? And you even ate with them? What's that remind you of? What was the, what was the main criticism that was brought to Jesus, about Jesus? Was the, that he, he associated with sinners and ate with them. Here's a continuation of Jesus' ministry taking place. And Peter told them exactly what had happened. And, 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 he, and then they... Instead of the criticism, they were all um, filled with joy and delight and they praised God for the way he'd opened the, opened the doors um, for a sharing of the gospel with the Gentiles. And, and why wouldn't he? I mean, I'm, I'm amazed that Peter had been so slow to, to catch on to this and, and the apostles had been so, so slow to catch on to the, to the way... God wanted to, to have the, God so loved the world, John's Gospel says, uh, that he gave his only son. The way Jesus ministered to, to other than Jews, even in, 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 in his short time of ministry, um, was, was a, an opener to what was about to take place. And so I think, yeah, Peter certainly caught on quickly with those three revelations and then um, over time, the rest of the, uh, seeing that taking place, the rest of the community. And having those six other witnesses there was an incredible blessing for Peter to, um, to really bring the point home to his uh, Jerusalem, the Jerusalem church. So being open to the Spirit's leading, it's sometimes we're tempted to, to run ahead of, of God and the Holy Spirit. We're going to bring on the second coming by our witness, our leading others to Jesus. No, we need to be dependent on the Holy Spirit, observant of his timing, his actions, the opportunities that he coordinates. The psalmist in Psalm 27, right at the end of the psalm, it's a beautiful psalm, and it's uh, at, right at the end, it says, and this really ties in with what you were sharing, Jordan. It says, wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. And you almost expect the words of a Nike ad, you know, just do it. But it, instead it says, wait patiently for the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? Wait patiently for the Lord. Be, be attentive to listening to his voice speaking into our lives. Be attentive to following his leadings, his promptings, to change our prayer when he prompts us to, to follow his leading and direction in our lives, to be attentive to the Lord and act on his leading and choosing that song that we sang early on, and I'm going to get our group to share at the end as well. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. That was certainly the case for Peter, wasn't it? Um, the borders opened up, and it's something that um, God wants to journey with each of us on. So I see two starkly different stories, and I, I put them up on the screen, and you might um, like to show it from the back there. Thanks, guys. Between the two stories that I've shared with you this morning, 
uh, they're, they're quite contrasting stories. Yes, Peter is part of both of those stories, but in, with Ananias and Sapphira, it was a guile generosity, and by that I mean it, it, it was a generosity to be noticed, whereas that of, of um, Cornelius was guileless. It was innocent. It was without, without ulterior motive in his generosity of spirit. And Ananias and Sapphira was self-focused, whereas Cornelius was, was other-focused. It was to the Jews um, there in, 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 in Acts 5, whereas in Acts 10, here, here the Gentiles are being opened up to the gospel. <laughs> in, in Acts 5, they were dead to the Holy Spirit. Well, they were dead. Um, and, and whereas in Acts 10, they were attentive to the Holy Spirit. And the outcome in Acts 5 was a, a nihilism of, 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 of outlook where, where there was meaninglessness and nothingness to, to the, the lives of Ananias and Sapphira, whereas in Acts 10, the outcome was to become Holy Spirit-filled and devoted followers of Jesus. Incredibly contrasting stories. I want to share with you a third story. Just briefly, and Robin, I'm going to invite you to come and share this story with us. When Robin shared this with me, I thought, oh, I've, got to, I've got to share this with our church family. We need to share this with our church family because it's a, it's a, a real eye-opener to the way the Holy Spirit is continuing to act in our lives. And we've had that demonstrated this morning already. And I just wonder if you'd just share this little story that you shared with me, Robin. Yeah. <laughs> you know... As Christians, we believe the Holy Spirit is at work within us, but he's also at work around us. And when he invites us to join the work that he's doing around us, it can be really exciting and inspiring and very encouraging. And um, th This story happened uh, maybe two or three, well, about three weeks ago, I think. And uh, I'd gone shopping and I'd bought something in a shop and I came out of the shop and I had my handbag and I had the parcel I'd bought and I had this little bag which is kind of folded up into a, a parcel. And I was trying to undo the, this bag to get the carry bag out from the inside and I couldn't do it. It just wouldn't come out. And so I sat down on a seat. Um, it was one of those round seats that they have in some of the shopping areas. I sat down on the seat still trying to undo the bag. And there was a lady sitting next to me and she had a great big trolley full of party things. You now cans of drink and chips and a big box on the top, a big cake box on the top. And she said to me, oh, those bags are tricky. I said, you know, they are. And so we, we got talking and she told me that her husband's birthday was the next day and she was going to have a party. But the ice cream cake in the box was going to melt because she had left her phone at home and she needed to ring her husband to come and get her so she could get the ice cream cake into the freezer. And so I said, well, you can use my phone. And so I took it out and sanitised it as we do these days. Had, had, you, had you asked Nick about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, handed her the phone and she rang her husband she sanitised the phone, gave it back to me, and she started to tell me about her husband having surgery in a couple of weeks and how he'd had an infection in his elbow and he needed it to be, um, to be cleaned out and they were really worried about him. And I was about to say to him, to her, can I pray for him? And... Um, before I could get that out of my mouth, she said to me, a little like your story, Owen, um, you're a Christian, aren't you? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I am. How did you know? And she said, oh, I just know these things. And <laughs> she said, I'm a Christian too. And so we chatted for a little while about the Holy Spirit and about different things while we waited for her husband to come. And then she turned to me and she said, do you know about the Sabbath? And I said, well, yes. <laughs> I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And she said, wow. She said, I've been wanting to meet one of you. <laughs> and, so, and so she said, I've got some questions. She said, you know, six years ago, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said that 
he wanted to teach me something. And so he led me on a, a study through the Bible about the Sabbath. And she said, I, be, I came, became convicted about the Sabbath, that this was something that was really special and something he wanted for me. And she said, but I didn't know very much about it. When do you start Sabbath? <laughs> and so I explained, you know, what we do, how, how we observe it. And then she said, you know, she said, every time my friends come to visit me, I tell them about Sabbath and how beautiful it is. She said, you know, I've got 11 people meeting in my home every Sabbath morning and we study the Bible and we pray and we worship together and it's just great. We have lunch together. Oh, she said, I need your phone number. <laughs> and so we shared our phone numbers and uh, we've been in correspondence ever since, uh, just sh sharing things about God, sharing things to pray for. And um, her husband's had the surgery and I'm about to find out how that went. But, you know, I have a new friend, which I'm really excited about. And um, I've been blessed by her friendship. And she says she's been blessed by mine, and I guess the future's up to the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. It's story's not finished, eh? And uh, what, a, what an incredible way in which the, the Holy Spirit um, works through situations in, in our lives. And, yeah, thanks so much for sharing that with us, Robin. You know, I guess individually um, what I'd love us to, to recognise today is that each of us can be available to the Holy Spirit's filling us with his fruit. And, and, and that we each can, can be an influence for others in life through the Holy Spirit using us in ways that we don't even know about. And I, I just want to invite you to do a, a simple thing at the start of each day in your time with God. I just want to invite you if, you, if you're not doing this already, to pray these words. Lord, lead me today to someone in whom your spirit is at work. Lead me today to someone in whom your spirit is at work. And so we're not running ahead of the Holy Spirit. We're not saying, hey, Lord, I've got this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to work for you and I'm going to be your witness uh, to the ends of the earth. But we're dependent on the Spirit. We're waiting on the Spirit to be there, to lead and to guide. He's the leader. I'm the follower. And I'm going to be open to being used by the Spirit as his instrument, his tool, where his Spirit is already at work in someone's life. Lord, lead me today to someone in whom your Spirit is at work. And I think corporately as a community, I'd like to challenge us, particularly at this time. You know, we've been through the uh, a significant crisis and who knows what the, the future holds in terms of that. Um, but we've been through a crisis of where we've, we've come to a place where we need to reassess. We've needed to reassess who we are, what we're about. How do we operate as community together? And I think as we, as we go through that process of reassessment and reevaluation, to take on that compass reading that's there for us, and to know whose voice we're listening to for direction and who we're going to follow into that future as community together. And we want to be open to that as well. It may take us along different, uh, uh, different ways of operation as church community, but we want to be open to the Spirit's leading in that whole process as well. Uh, my prayer for us today is that like the wind around us that's invisible but impactful, 
that we might be open to the Spirit's leading in each of our lives and in our community life together as we grow in the Holy Spirit's fruit ingredients. I'm just going to invite our our group to come up and to just share that song again with us and, um, and then we'll have a closing prayer together. But yeah, what a beautiful expression of our openness to the Holy Spirit and uh, let's sing it together with, with um, the depth of meaning of knowing that the Holy Spirit is there. We want him involved in our lives as well. God bless each of us.